it's really a pleasure to be here to tell you a little bit about our work, our recent work, which really sits um, at the intersection of three different constructs. One is the self-regulation, and I'll talk a little bit about that. The other one is stress physiology, and the uh, last one is family or school context. And so um, just to start with self-regulation, it's a really broad umbrella term that encompasses a lot of different set of skills. Today I'm going to specifically talk about executive functions. These are a set of skills that are higher order, or, higher order cognitive skills that help children achieve goal-directed behavior through regulating their attention, their behavior, and emotions. And hopefully I'll build a case why we need to pay attention to these set of skills. Um, there are really three components to executive functioning. Uh, the first one that develops really early is inhibitory control. This you see already in two-year-olds and three-year-olds. As they are starting to navigate their world, they're learning how to maybe suppress sometimes impulsive behaviors or um, uh, ignore certain distractions, to do what they're told maybe rather than what they wish they would be doing. So to really control their behavior and attention. And then as they get older, they develop the second cognitive skill, which is working memory. And this is a set of skills that help them hold information, and this could be verbal information, it could be nonverbal information in their head, and they somehow manipulate and update and use it almost to kind of multitask, to follow multi-step procedures. You can imagine what that looks like in the classroom, um, to know how to follow through without forgetting steps along the way. The last one is the cognitive flexibility. It's the most advanced um, uh, set of skills which help children shift flexibly between competing demands and competing rules um, and to be able to kind of flexibly think about the problem. And, and you'll see what that uh, looks like in a kind of classroom context or um, in the playground context, is being able to adjust your behavior accordingly to kind of ever-changing rules and demands of the environment. Now, I'm going to show you a really quick video um, because I think it's helpful to see how we assess these set of skills. There's many ways to ask parents to report on how these set of skills um, get expressed in their homes or teachers in their classrooms. Uh, both of these reporters can have a little bit of biases when they're observing children. So we try sometimes to use direct assessments to get at really true capacities of these set of kids to um, um, use these set of skills. And so here is a task. Um, this is um, in a homeless shelter, so with a very disadvantaged population. And the task is very simple. Um, when experimenter taps once, the kid is to tap twice. And when experimenter taps twice, ex uh, the child is to tap once. It's a very simple task. We've used it even in rural Pakistan with four-year-olds. You're looking at, is the child able to inhibit just mimicking what you've done? Hold it, implement the rule. So you can see how he's monitoring, seeing, reflecting. So why study executive functioning? First, these set of skills are what we call a basic building blocks of early childhood competencies. We have now um, connected these set of skills to both cognitive development, as indicated by both school readiness, engagement, also working skills, staying on task, collaborating with peers, as well as specific math and literacy skills. On the other side, on socio-emotional, these set of behaviors support children's ability to connect with peers, uh, to know when to stop, when to observe, how to play collaboratively in a playground, how to follow the rules. They also help children connect with teachers, uh, connect with their parents. Um, they help them uh, control their behavior when they're angry or frustrated. So they're really kind of these building blocks of everything we would like these kids to do to succeed in life. Now, we have also connected these set of skills in middle childhood. And this is really important to uh, highlight is that the part of the brain that support these set of skills continue to develop into young adulthood. So these are very flexible set of skills, which means that children who are at risk or maybe show some delays or disadvantage can be promoted. These set of skills can be promoted at almost your whole uh, life long because they're very, what we would call, malleable set of skills. And so you can see we have linked it, these direct assessments to teacher report of being able to stay on task, being assertive in a classroom, um, tolerating frustration, showing good social, pro-social skills, as well as less acting out. Now, 
it's not, I don't want you to walk away from here thinking like this is the end all be all, these set of skills are the only thing that matters. It's not that. It's just that we also found that these set of skills set what we call developmental cascades in motion, which means that these set of skills at critical points of development can make a difference for other domains. So in this longitudinal study, what we did is we followed kindergarten kids, over 300 kinder kindergarten kids, from fall of kindergarten to spring of kindergarten to their first grade. So very important transition to school period. And so we know that if you look at these domains, this is going to be probably the most complicated thing I'm going to show you. We measure closeness with teachers. We measure school engagement, how much you like school. Do you want to go to school? Are you happy to be at school? Um, impulsivity in attention, so uh, not being able to regulate yourself, being inattentive, not being able to sit still, being impulsive, and then conflict with teachers. Now, we know that all of these four things are important for school success. We also know that over time, these things are stable. They kind of previous levels of conflict predicts future levels of conflict. Previous level of school engagement predicts future school engagement, right? These things are relatively stable. So we were interested, what shows these spillover effects, right? What will affect future development over and beyond this developmental stability, right? Continuity. And so what we find is that kids who come with impulsivity and attention in kindergarten, they show more conflict with teachers by the end of that school year. They also show less school engagement. They just start liking school less. And that carries over into first grade. So inattention and impulsivity at the end of a kindergarten also predicts more conflict with teachers in the first grade. And what's also important to notice is that school engagement at the end of kindergarten will then predict future not only how close you are to teachers, this new teacher that you're going to have in the first grade, but also how well you're doing academically, right? So it's a setting really important, these cascades, these spillover effects in motion. So teacher, teacher closeness also matters. Liking schools also matters. But we're trying to find what are these things that where you can intervene, where it really matters, and then it's going to cascade and set kids on the good trajectories over a longer period of time. The other thing that we are finding is that we're always interested in how classrooms climate or what teachers do in the classrooms matters for achievement, right, for academic achievement. And so what we find is that executive functioning skills, again, directly measured, really explain how classrooms affect achievement the next year. So we are finding these models where um, change or growth in these set of skills within the academic year will then predict how classrooms or how what teachers did in the classroom affect change on achievement test scores, right? So it's a, it's a kind of a process barrier. It explains how context gets to affect children's achievement on tests with our little bit removed kind of outcome. The other thing that we found is when you look at at-risk children, so uh, in a study of homeless children living with their families in the emergency shelter, these are kindergartners, first graders, we looked at what matters for them when it comes to how teachers sees them in the classroom, right? Which are the kids that are thriving, they are showing okay um, a relationship with their peers, they're not failing in school, they're not showing any mental health problems, so depression, uh, anxiety, or acting out. Um, and we find that this set of skills really differentiates children who we would call resilient from those who are not. Even after your control for what we would say traditional protective factors like parental quality, IQ, as well as exposure of risk. Because even in the homeless population, you still have very different exposure to risk factors, right? Not everybody's equally exposed to risk. Now, what's sad is that these kids who need the most these set of skills also have the lowest levels of these set of skills. So what you can see on this side over here, this kind of stepwise graph, is colleagues of mine looked at children who are living in poverty. And they measured these set of skills at age four, and they basically show for every year that your family lived in the poverty, you had lower levels of these skills. The other graph, these lines that are kind of showing the similar gap, is children's executive functioning skills from age nine to 18 as a function of their parents' education. And you see these important socioeconomic gaps 
that are there at age nine and they don't close. They're just basically persisting over time. So it's really important for us, what can we do really early on to promote this set of skills? The other aspect of my work that I'm going to tell you just a little bit about is stress physiology. Because you can imagine it's not just the actual amount on a paycheck or the actual years of education that parents had that undermine this set of skills. It's the stressors that come from potentially not having enough financial resources or you know, not having a job that um, provides enough opportunities for your child um, to engage in kind of enriching experiences, right? Which is where things like Big Lift comes into place. And so what happens is that when children experience challenging and stressful situations throughout their daily lives, their bodies respond to that. They basically activate certain systems that help them deal and cope with these challenges and stressors. Now, some kids are very reactive and some kids are less reactive. And those reactive kids are vigilant. They may have their heart raised, they may sweat, they may get really um, upset emotionally, or, or, but also physiologically about what's happening around them, right? And these changes are helpful. They're, they're adapting in the short periods of time. But when you live in a chronic poverty or a chronic exposure to risk, um, these changes wear and tear on your body. Okay, they, they basically undermine, they flood your brain with stress hormones and they undermine the same biological basis that I was telling you that promote this set of skills, right? And so we're trying to understand how can we basically um, ameliorate some of this risk effect on the brain so that children can um, thrive and develop these set of skills that are so important and not just um, another thing that's exciting about these set of skills is that they're really culturally, they're, they're not dependent on cultural experiences. So some of our international work shows that, you know, really your culture and your society can decide what is important behavior for you to pursue and you still need these set of skills, right? It's not, it's not that just our society in this time, in this demographic, thinks these set of skills are important. They're important for whatever your, soci for your society or time decides that the, the goal-directed behavior is. But there's a promising story here, and that is that these reactive kids, these stress-reactive kids, are not just vulnerable. So um, we are finding that these children are just more sensitive to their environmental experiences. So children who demonstrate this heightened physiological response, sure enough, they're going to be worse off if they come from adverse backgrounds, but if we expose them to the nurturing and supporting, they actually do better off than the low reactive kids. So there is a, there's a metaphor that has kind of developed to describe these differences in children's reactivity, that these highly reactive kids are kind of like orchids children, that they are just, they're going to thrive more if you give them positive environment, and they're going to have more difficulty if you don't. Whereas the low reactive kids are more like dandelions. They're just less affected by environment. And we now we have evidence of this um, looking at both broad construct, like school engagement, pro-social behaviors, academic achievement, but we also have this um, effect on executive functioning skills too. So potentially showing that even in the self-regulatory behaviors, the reactive kids, if they come from adverse backgrounds, they do worse off. If they come from positive backgrounds, they do better. So, Often people ask, so is it the low reactive kids that are better off? Is, is that the resilience kids? And you know, if you just follow what I just said, it would be like, yes, they, they will be less affected by environment. But not necessarily. It's actually a little bit more complicated. And it's complicated because, as you all know, kids are not just flowers in the pot. They just don't sit there and have environment affect them. They can do something about it, right? And so some of our more recent uh, studies show that children who have good self-regulation, they can recover faster, physiologically recover faster from these challenges and stressors in the environment. And so what we're trying to now study and really focus on is how are children physiologically ready to learn, right? So they all come to your classrooms and to learn they have to be alert, they have to be focused, they have to be prepared to bounce back. Um, if they experience any setbacks. And yet we know that many children around the globe, not just in US, come to schools with dysregulated physiology. Some may be hyper aroused or heightened aroused. 
some may be hypo-aroused or kind of have diminished arousal because maybe they didn't sleep well, they didn't have a breakfast, maybe they witnessed a conflict right before coming to the classroom. And so we're trying to come up with strategies to help teachers bring kids to that optimal arousal, their optimal biological readiness to pay attention to study and learn. So I just want you to kind of think about the biology that is so important, um, not just the behavior. The other thing I want to talk about is family system. And um, a lot what we do with families really applies to teachers as well. So we have focused on parenting practices that promote this set of skills. And broad constructs that we look at is scaffolding. As you can imagine, this is really important teachers and mentors, formal and, or informal mentors. And this is this idea that you, as an adult, can promote autonomy in these children, you can scaffold and enrich their language, you can be there to promote their skill development, uh, praise and elaborate on what they have. So uh, it, it's that set of skills that really matter. In addition to maybe more just um, exposure to more stimulating environments. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about quickly about two studies. One is actually in um, a what I mentioned earlier in rural Pakistan with about 1,400 children who were exposed from zero to two to this um, early childhood intervention where moms were really taught how to be more responsive and contingent, how to read in children's cues, how to take very simple toys like cups and spoons or make uh, like no cost or very low cost toys and just stimulate cognitive development in children uh, between ages zero and two. And then they pr were provided feedback, they were scaffolded, they, they met as a group for, um, uh, on a monthly basis. And what we find is that when these kids are four, we find that not only this intervention that ended at age two still made a difference at age four, but that it really worked through scaffolding behavior, through mom's ability to scaffold this play and cognition, as well as through kind of more enriching home environment and stimulation. In addition to that, we're also looking to small aspects of co-regulation. So when you think of babies, you know, they don't have this set of skills. The parent or caregiver becomes a really important role in helping them kind of co-regulate together, right? Staying regulated together. And so we're looking at um, kindergarten kids and kind of five and six-year-olds, how parents basically, when they are interacting with their children through play or conversation, how are they helping kids stay regulated, right? And we're looking at these momentary changes. Like, it's okay to get this regulated. It's okay to act out. But what do you do as a diet? Not just as a child alone, but what do you do as a diet? If your child is acting out, or if you get angry yourself, how quickly can you get back to that positive co-regulation, right? Because it's going to happen, right? But what are the set of skills that you have to kind of together as a diet, not just all about children, but together as a diet, stay positively regulated? And we find that these micro-social, these small second-to-second -second interactions really matter in explaining how teachers later on see these kids in the classrooms and whether the kids uh, showed kind of well-regulated behavior in the classrooms. So often people ask, me, you know, well, what, what does this look like? What can, I, what can I go home and tell, you know, parents or teachers, what can they do? And so Harvard um, Center has put together this wonderful pamphlet, and I'm going to tell you just a little bit about, just to kind of get a flavor of what, um, what makes a difference. In infancy, playing is critical. And the reason it's critical is because we often want our kids to stay regulated in context of negative emotions, right? So you want a kid who is angry. Somebody kicked him, or they failed on the test to stay well-regulated, or they're frustrated or bored. But the best self-regulation is being learned in the context of positive emotion. Because when you're really excited, when you're really ramped up, and you're really enjoying something, that's the good time to start learning, how do you regulate this excitement? How do you regulate this uh, positive emotions? Because that, those set of skills will transfer and be important for negative emotions. So <coughs> when you, children learn, sequences like an itsy bitsy spider or they are learning singing kind of predictable rhymes 
uh, that includes certain hand gestures. They're learning exactly the inhibitory control, working memory sequences, flexibly shifting. Oh, now it's your turn. Now it's my turn. I play peekaboo. So, I, you, so you have all of these set of skills built in right into those experiences. Preschool, pretend play. When you pretend play, you really have to keep all those rules. What is your play partner doing? Are you in the character? Uh, who is doing what? Did somebody now introduce a new idea? How do you adjust to that, right? Again, all of those set of skills. <coughs> Elementary school. I think you guys are getting the, getting the point here, right? Um, physical activities, games, um, board games, puzzles, dancing, cooking, learning to play an instrument. All of these things require monitoring, flexibility, following the rules, inhibiting impulsive reaction, ignoring distractions, right? And not to say that it's all about playing. Um, talking to children makes a big difference, right? So uh, actively focusing and sustaining attention, ignoring distraction, bilingual experience, being able to shift between two languages is a critical to that cognitive flexibility. It's, that's exactly what bilingual children do. They're constantly shifting between two set of rules. <coughs> the developing routines, study skills, planning, storytelling, it's a fantastic um, a, a way to develop these. Um, so building in whatever culturally, familiarly appropriate is for that age, for that kid, there's a lot of wonderful experiences. Now, I want to finish with just one point, and that is that we're starting to look at executive functioning in caregivers, in both parents and teachers, because both good parenting and good teaching requires these set of skills, requires not just executive functioning, but also emotion regulation um, in, in teachers and parents. And this is just you know, a few photos to kind of um, uh, you know, comically um, explain why these set of skills would matter. Uh, but we do have a set of studies now showing that ch the parents with better EF skills show less harsh and less reactive parenting, show greater sensitivity, greater responsiveness, um, and then higher levels of this cognitive scaffolding. So we are really pushing for organizations to think about this two-generational approach. So not just promoting this set of skills in children, but also in their caregivers and their teachers, especially if this caregiving and teaching happens in very high-risk uh, context. And finally, you know, it's really important to encourage parents or teachers to relax, to be regulated themselves. And I like to show that maybe it used to be this way you were used to relax at some point in time, but maybe it's this way right now. But it's really important that, you know, it's not only about children and what we do for children, but what we do for ourselves so that we could be better caregivers to those children. And I think that is something we're really looking into now. Thank you. Great. <laughs>